I love this quote from Earl Scruggs, um, how Earl used to say everyone has just like one song inside themselves and everything they write is some variation of that one song. Do you feel like that's true of yourself? Um, I think I have more than one tune, maybe four tunes. Four tunes, love it, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm very excited to be talking with the great John Reichman today. You guys might know him from his work with the good old persons, with the Tony Rice unit, or with his own band, John Reichman and the Jaybirds. He's a fantastic mandolin player, owns perhaps one of the best sounding Lloyd Lore mandolins of all time, and he just has released a brand new record called New Time, an old acoustic. So excited to have you here, John. How's it going? It's going great. I'm happy to be here. So. You've been playing some different instruments recently, right? Tell me about what's been in your arsenal recently. Sure. Um, well, the most recent uh, instrument I've gotten is a really nice octave mandolin made by Jason Bowerman. This is a, a, a flat top guitar shaped uh, octave mandolin. And uh, I had had a couple um, arch top with F hole octave mandolins, which were really nice instruments, but they were just a little bit challenging for me to play, you know, just, I always felt like I really had to, to work up to being able to perform with any, you know, confidence on those instruments. Just maybe it was, you know, the left hand and the right hand to a certain extent, and also the fact that it was F holes. But when I played this laptop, round sound hole octave, it was just really easy to me. And the sound was, was really appealing to me as well. And uh, I guess the thing about it is I like it mainly for sort of a, an accompanying type instrument, you know, so it sort of has a guitarish sustain. It's, it's shaped like a small orchestra model, Martin. So he calls them uh, the Bambino. I really like it a lot. You know, on the, on the new recording, I, I play a fiddle tune on it and it's mostly rhythm, but I do take a solo and uh, I really have to get used to the string spacing, just solo with any confidence on it. Uh, but for rhythm, it's just a beautiful sounding instrument, just great sustain and nice depth to it. And so I had the Lloyd Lore. I bought that Lloyd Lore and I couldn't afford anything else for a long time. I really was taken with the Lawrence Smart Mandolas because a couple different people that I knew had, had them and I played them and I, I really thought they were great sounding instruments. So I uh, worked out a deal with Lawrence and he made one for me and uh, in 1997 and I've had it ever since and, and it's been a good alternative instrument you know I've, I've used it in different contexts like mostly what I do is I tune the C and G strings uh, in octaves okay. and it takes on this kind of quality of a Cuban trace or a Puerto Rican quattro and I played you know or tried to play a lot of that kind of music so it's it suits that style and then sometimes I'll drop the the highest uh, pairs, which are A, down to G, so it's uh, C, G, D, G. Oh, okay, cool. And and I kind of fall into that sort of frailing pattern. I've I've sort of utilized a lot in my tunes, like Salt Spring, and so I can get this kind of frailing banjo effect. Speaking of Salt Spring, uh, amazing composition, by the way. I was just out in Colorado and heard a bunch of people playing that at jams all night long. And I know that came out originally on a 2000 release with the Jaybirds. Really excited to hear this new recording that you've made of this same tune on the brand new record. Um, but I've heard that this tune was composed on an old Martin guitar, right? I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that and what you know composition is like on different instruments. You know, talking about the octave mandolin, the mandola, the guitar. Like, what's your approach for that? Well, um, so I, I did start it on this little old Martin guitar. I think it was from the twenties, like a 018, or maybe it was a double 018. Uh, some friends owned who lived and still live on Salt Spring Island. So that's where the title came from. And this guitar is just playing around on it, killing time. And it's just really inspiring instrument to play very resonant. And I was um, playing out of a open D chord shape and moving my fingers around to get some drones and this melody sort of suggested itself. And so, and it was memorable enough that I, I don't think I re even needed to record it. And it was just the A part of the tune. You know, that's one way I compose a lot is just from playing an instrument. I'll just, something will occur to me from playing it that sounds good or an accident might happen. And so what I did is uh, I got back home and thought, well, this is on the guitar. I'm not really performing on guitar. I'm not really, I'm, I'm more of a mandolin player. So I thought I'd, I'd figure out what the melody was 
on the mandolin, but I chose to change the key to A major. I'm not sure why I did that, but I just, you know, A is a fun key to play in. And then for a B part, I had had this little riff that I always just fell into playing. I wasn't ever trying to write it as a tune. It just was something that was satisfying. And it really um, had the same right hand frailing pattern where you're playing uh, bum, diddy, bum, diddy, bum, diddy, bum, diddy, bum, you know. And so that's the underlying roll pattern, if I guess that's what you would call it, with that the melody uh, adapts to as best it can. So that that, you know, little um, device helped shape that tune, I think. So that's that's how I, I wrote that tune. I was hoping to get to talk a little bit more about composition with you because I know that's such uh, a big part of your musical voice. You've, um, I don't know, in my mind, you've kind of become like the premier mandolin composer of our time and all, all your tunes being so well known and being played at different places around the world. I was actually um, just thinking about to this time I was in France at this bluegrass festival called La Roche and we were hearing Salt Spring on pretty much like every town corner all these bluegrass jams that were happening there and we've heard it in Japan and all sorts of places in England and Ireland and uh, coming to the mandolin I didn't really think about myself as a composer um, but you know thinking about where you started out like what was the first thing that made you interested in the idea of composing or the thing that made you identify more as a composer well I mean I actually started writing tunes early on let's see I'm trying to think of when I started really playing the mandolin I guess I was in high school but the first few years didn't count because I tuned it incorrectly <laughs> to an open tuning. But then when I, I guess when I um, went away to college, I'd gotten a nice uh, Gibson F2 mandolin and, and decided I would, you know, bite the bullet and tune it properly. And, and that's pretty much all I was interested in at that time was learning solos off records and learning fiddle tunes and whatnot. And um, I guess the idea of writing tunes came from mandolin players that I admired being composers as well, like David Grisman and Bill Monroe and Frank Wakefield. So I think David Grisman has a quote where he saw writing tunes as part of the mandolin player's job responsibility, mm -hmm. which now I feel that way. But I can't remember that the first tune I wrote, which I kind of liked, I'm not sure why I did it. If, it. if it was just occurred to me that this, you know, if I was just playing around and I thought, oh, this would make a tune. I don't think I looked at it as a responsibility. It was called the meat and potatoes rag, and it was mostly a, a an interesting chord progression that I shaped a melody over. And um, I can't quite remember how to play it, but I like I remember the chord progression, so maybe I'll dust that off someday. And then uh, in 1978, I joined the Good Old Persons in, in California. I'd been living in Oregon and moved down there. And they were, you know, such a great band to, because they had original material. Um, Paul Shalaski wrote, tunes wrote the great tune casadero which i learned in 1978 and um and kathy Callick is a wonderful songwriter and paul wrote great songs too so it was a, an environment where not only were we covering you know the bluegrass standards and country standards and you know just whatever t songs we liked um there was room for original material too so i think right around that time i wrote it's been real and, and then i also inspired by David Grisman's King of the Gypsies soundtrack, I wrote Birdland Breakdown. And I wrote a couple other in the in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, but it was never, I, was, I wasn't super prolific at that point. Even up until my first recording, North of the Border, there were five tunes on there. And and some of those, I just, you know, I don't think they're, they're bad tunes, but maybe not my most memorable. But then somehow uh, that Up in the Woods recording where I, there were all originals and all in a bluegrass vein more or less that gave me the confidence that i could really write tunes but i hadn't written anything new for for a long time when those tunes started to come to me in fact the first two eighth of february and ponies in the forest came to me when i was in a state of sleep sleep deprivation <laughs> so that might have had something to do with it. I was I was actually wanting to ask you, uh, what's your general writing process? Do you feel 
like you have to wait to the right moment to feel inspired to write. I know you've talked about, you know, being out on walks and having melodies kind of come to you, which sounds so amazing, so organic. But my experience as a composer has been like much more of the gun to the head mentality where I've got like, you know, a recording session coming up and I have to write all of a sudden this big batch of tunes to record or, you know, a band to, you know, write a tune for or something like that. Um, like, how do you walk that tightrope between um, feeling inspired to write and feeling that necessity like David Grisman talked about? Yeah, well, I've never been successful at saying I'm going to write a tune too much, except Big Bug is a tune on my North of the Border recording. And I started that as I wanted to write sort of a, a bluesy Monroe type tune in the key of E. And so I kind of came up with something, but then it slowly morphed into more of a, um, a busier um, right hand and more of a breakdown. So it evolved from the initial um, concept to something that is ultimately better, I think. Uh, but I think the main ingredient to composing successfully is just having free time and space. <laughs> for me, it, it is. And that can be, you know, like going for a walk. You know, a lot of tunes have come to me that way, some of my favorite ones. I remember writing a tune at a sound check, or actually I've written a few tunes at a sound check where I'm just noodling along and, and an idea pops in. Sound checks, you're killing a lot of time and you have the instrument in your hand. That's that's one way. Lately, I think for this most recent recording, some tunes have come to me pretty quickly and a couple of them were just concepts, like the Waltz Serafina. I, I uh, was looking at Instagram and this post from Peghead Nation came up where it was talking about Mike Witcher teaching I think Midnight on the Water on Dobro, and I wanted to get Mike to play on this recording. I thought, oh, he likes to play waltzes in D. I picked up the mandolin and that tune just pretty much laid right out. And at first, you know, I thought, is, is this just like a Prairie Jewel from the last record? And maybe the vibe is the same and the key is the same, but it's really a different melody. So I just, I don't, I try not to second guess myself too much mm -hmm. as far as does this sound like this or does this sound like that? Because they all have similarities with pre-existing tunes. And then um, I had this one tune called uh, Bali Huli, that is a tune that came to me in Ireland and I wanted to have a, a tune to go in a medley with it. And I thought it's in the E minor, maybe D major would be a cool key to, to jump to. And so I picked up the mandolin and pretty much wrote this little tune in D called Uncle John Naya. That medley, Bali Huli, it's the name of a, um, a town in, in Ireland, came to me as a melody in my head while I was in Ireland. I just heard it, you know, I'd heard a bunch of great Irish traditional music on that trip, and that tune came to me, and I'd had it for a while. It took me a while to kind of decide on the chords and decide the presentation, and then I thought, well, it'd be good to, to have it go into a second tune, and that's where, and John Nyan was our tour manager, so I wanted mm -hmm. to write one in honor of him, and, uh, that tune just really, I'm pretty happy with it, how it came out. I know Uncle John uh, from a few chance meetings in Ireland, um, and uh, he's quite the character. Uh, legendary, as they say. Yeah, he's done so much for bluegrass music uh, on that side of the ocean. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. It just brings a smile to my face listening to that track. So you said that you try not to second guess yourself as a composer, and I feel like that's the biggest head game when coming to write a tune. Like oftentimes there's like this inner dialogue that is happening within me uh, as I write a tune, you know, there's this inner voice that says, okay, that's not good enough, or that sounds exactly like something else you've written, or you're just ripping someone else off. Um, like, how do you, how do you rein that in when you're composing to um, get through the process of creating something so that you can be analytical later on, like once you have something written, if that makes sense? Um, I guess... It, it, just from doing it enough and having tunes where I th I'm thinking this must be something else or this sounds like this and and but just doing it so many times that they end up not being another tune that pre-exists haven't completely plagiarized it and also not listening to what other people say too because mm -hmm. you know a lot of times I played a new tune for someone and then they just have this reaction off the top of their head that oh that sounds like St. Anne's reel or that sounds like jerky shuffle or just because it has a similar little phrase or a similar chord progression or it just reminds them of that tune not that it really sounds like that tune so I've just um, learned to ignore that. 
I love that answer. It's a tune on the Jaybird's most recent record called Daylighting the Creek. I played that for someone and they said, well, it sounds like Uncle Penn. And I said, like, what? <laughs> but it actually, the melody does follow the same melody as Uncle Penn, but it's so different rhythmically in the, and it stops being Uncle Penn almost immediately, so. There's this quote from uh, one of my favorite authors, um, C.S. Lewis, who you know wrote a bunch of amazing fiction and prose, and um, and he said something about um, I'll butcher the quote, but he said something about how someone who's concerned with originality will never be original, <laughs> and um, I think that's true. You know, if you're trying to be original, then um, you kind of let all this great music go to waste because um, you're you're just putting the filter up too high, I guess. Um, my my dad always says it's better to get it written, not right, <laughs> which I think is really helpful to, um, then you have the chance to kind of step back and, and listen to it and make tweaks and changes that, um, you know, make it even more uh, original. As someone who's as well versed in composition as yourself and has written, I'm sure, you know, hundreds of tunes um, throughout your career, like what are some things that you do to push yourself to try coming up with new things? Or is it something that comes natural to you? Um. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was lucky with this past year. Um, you know, I had when I, I started the record before uh, the pandemic, just just shortly before that, and I didn't really have that many original tunes to go. I had some ideas of some covers and some ready to go, but that time at home really was beneficial to writing enough tunes for the rest of the record. I don't, I think most of all these just came to me in the, in the same various organic ways. You know, I didn't, nothing that I struggled to write very much. Um, and then, you know, one tune, Dandy Long Legs, was a melody that came to me and I thought, this is generic sounding. It doesn't, you know, it sounds, I don't know, like a, a million other tunes, but then I realized it had its own unique quality and started thinking of it more like um, presenting it like a Monroe tune from the 80s, you know, like mm -hmm. the master of bluegrass record with all those great tunes. It sounds like those tunes, but it, to me, it's somewhat reminiscent of that vibe, you know, old Ebenezer Scrooge or old Dangerfield, Southern flavor, that kind of thing. I wasn't really going to work on it too much, but then I decided to, and I'm happy with that, how that came out too, with this very straightforward bluegrass um, presentation. Yeah, I feel like some of the compositions that I write that I'm least happy with at the beginning, sometimes like after development, after recording them and seeing how other musicians interpret it in the studio, um, they kind of come to life in a new way and sometimes become some of my favorites um, just because it was so surprising or unexpected how it actually would turn out. I love this quote from Earl Scruggs, um, how Earl used to say everyone has just like one song inside themselves and everything they write is some variation of that one song. Do you feel like that's true of yourself? Or... Um, I think I have more than one tune, maybe four tunes. Four tunes, love it, yeah. I, yeah, because, you know, the North Shore isn't like Salt Spring, you know, it's slow waltz and a minor key and a happy mm -hmm. A major. So uh, just different moods, I guess. You know, one tune that on this new record that, that came out, which surprised me, was I was preparing a little tutorial on an open tuning for sore fingers. And so I thought I'd do one on this tuning I use on the mandolin, on, uh, like on Ponies in the Forest. It's just G, D, A, D. So I have the E's down to D and it works for a nice drone sound. And uh, I was getting ready to do that and just playing with the mandolin. And I'd used it for D tunes. It's obvious for that. And it also works for G tunes. And then it just occurred to me, that D is the third of B minor. I wonder if it would work for B minor. And as soon as I tried that, this tune, the old road to Kingham, just suggested itself immediately. Like played this double stop and the melody started and I pretty much had the tune inspired by that tuning in that key. So that was a, a nice surprise. It's not a complicated tune, but I, I like it harmonically. I like the way the chord changes go. And I, and I, I gotta say, I was a little bit inspired by uh, Andrew Marlin's compositions because he's he's a great tune writer and he has written some tunes that are deceptively simple you know that's so beautiful and it's not you know going to a million chord changes and it's not a super noty melody so part of that uh, the old road to Kingham has this just repeated phrase but it's really my favorite part of that particular tune 
Awesome. Yeah, I love Andrew's stuff. He's like another prolific tune writer. I can't believe he just like dropped a double record out of nowhere. That's such a boss move. <laughs> he's amazing. And, and I'm not, not to say all his tunes are simple like that, but, uh, but this particular one, I think, um, inspired me. I, I find composition to be one of the more fulfilling things about playing the mandolin. And I think there should be more aspiring mandolin composers out there just because I feel like the mandolin is such a an uncharted territory when it comes to composition, being a newer instrument. I was just wondering what, what your advice would be to people who are just coming to composition on the mandolin for the first time. Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I think one thing's something I said earlier is just not worry about it, the tune sounding like something else, but also in addition to not worrying, just being aware that you may be, you know, if you're just starting out, you may have rewritten a uh, whiskey before breakfast, you know, something like that. But you can take tunes like Whiskey Before Breakfast and use them as a jumping off point too, in a different key. And maybe, you know, it'll suggest something else and then you can change it and subtly change it and see if you do come up with something on your own. Or, you know, play, just playing the mandolin a lot helps. And just, I don't know if this works for everyone, but a lot of these tunes of mine have just come from walking and having a, a clear, clear head. and not nothing to worry about too much just getting from point a to point b and you know it's almost like daydreaming but mm -hmm. with melodies try different keys too i think that's that's a, an inspiring thing too you know try keys you maybe haven't played in or not even comfortable with and the limitations of your being comfortable with that key might suggest something uh interesting i don't know if that works or not <laughs> frank wakefield because he's written you know new camp town races is a standard but it's in b flat you know, and so one of my favorites of his is Waltz and Bluegrass, and that's an F. And I learned that back when I started playing, really. I remember learning it off his his uh, rounder record, and uh, it was an F. And I thought, oh, I should change this to G. That would be way easier, but kept it an F, and it's been inspiration to me ever since. I was inspired by several recordings that were all instrumental and all original. Uh, not specifically, but I really like the recording is Tony Trishka's Hill Country. I think that's oh, the nice. name of it, where it's all bluegrass tunes he wrote. And Andy Statman's, uh, I think it's Andy's Ramble, where it's pretty mm. bluegrassy stuff. I th thought those were great. And I realized after the fact that Bela Flex Drive was an inspiration to me. And then plus all the, you know, David Grisman originals and that kind of thing. But just seeing this body of work of all originals in, you know, as a one concept that gave me a template to follow, I guess. Yeah, it seems like all that stuff just takes time and familiarity, getting to know the forms of fiddle tunes and the, the types of music that we play on the mandolin and just trying stuff out. Um, and I don't know, I always tell people that quantity is better than quality as well, too. Just, you always learn in the process, it seems like, at least that's been my, my case. Well. Thank you so much for, for joining us, John. It's been so fun getting to chat. And um, for all you listeners, be sure to check out the brand new record. It's out August 9th, 2021. And um, it's got an amazing cast of musicians on there. 12 new original John Reichman compositions that are fantastic. Be sure to give a listen and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for joining, John. Oh yeah, thanks, David. I, I look forward to picking a tune with you before too long. Take care. <laughs>